beloved brothers and sisters. I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who has ever been kind to me. Everyone who has ever loved me. And I would love to thank you all for being here with me today. I would like to recite a poem, a poem by one of my dearest friends, and it's called A Love Song to Myself. Lying, lying in the heart of silence, I hear a voice. It is the voice of myself. singing. I love you. I love you. I love you so much. And this song is the story of my life. The reunion ship, the marriage, and the knowing of myself, Asian and gay, that I am that, and much more than that. I would like to begin to tell you a story. The story of myself as a little boy. Little Tuck. And around the age of 12, it was a time when I was about to leave for school in the UK and, um, and these were our Sunday family din uh, lunches with my grandmother and the family. So on the table would be my grandmother, my father, my mother, and occasionally my uncle. And on the table, we would have usual conversations of um, my grandmother's life, about her stories, and I also shared mine. And I would get asked questions about school and, and, and what the activities I was up to. But on this one occasion, she said something very different. She said, Tuck, be careful that when you go to England, gay men may touch you. They may touch you in an inappropriate way. And my uncle, who is now, as of last year, the United Nations appointed as the first independent investigator to, project L to protect LGBTI people from violence had to also hear this too, and as a matter of fact, had to laugh with this matter. So little Tuck, 12-year-old logic, thought that being gay was not meant to be loved by my grandmother. And indeed, if my grandmother couldn't love me for who I was, how was the world and everyone else would be able to love me? This deeply pained me. It was a time at school at this time when I was questioning my sexuality. And for a very young boy, it's very scary. And at school, I would get asked the question, are you gay? Are you gay? Are you gay, mate? This was at school, this was at the corridors, this was in my classrooms, this was in the locker rooms, this was in the basketball court, it was everywhere. And this fear flooded me. I felt so ashamed to be myself that I decided not to be myself. <coughs> Through a process of denial and running, I decided to put on a mask. I put on a mask and said that I was straight. 
And I really did this because as I went home to a safe place that I was born in, when I told my parents about me having been bullied at school and they, they said they love me no matter what, no matter who I am, whether I'm gay or not, but you can really feel it and feel it and see it in their eyes that they didn't want me to be gay because they were fearful of what it might, what, what might happen to me. So indeed I wore this mask as a straight boy and by the next year I became the most popular kid in school. I became a ladies man. How that happened I'm not quite sure. <laughs> well indeed this mask that I use to overcome depression and I really feel those who've been in depression because in this dark hour there's just clouds and clouds and clouds of fear that would surround me and I couldn't get myself out of that. This proved to be short-lived lived, as I came to school in the UK. The same questions were asked at me. Are you gay? Are you gay? Are you gay mate? And so I made sure I wore the mask even stronger and it was in school in the UK that what I, was, I was exposed to another form of feeling less than. And it was a subtle feeling that being Asian, being of another race, was less than, that I could not appeal to the standard form of beauty that the white Caucasian standard of principles of advertising showed me. So, I wore a double mask. I was now straight and white. And you really learn that when you really don't show up as who you are, people fall in love with who you are not. And people were falling in love with who I was not. It was only when I moved from school and found in myself in London that I thought I would start fresh. I was willing to found out who it was that is Tuck. What is that truth who is Tuck? So I was willing to be myself and through this I came across a friend who ignited this courage within me. We started hanging out uh, in my first year of university and, and one day he came to me after many years of our, many months of our friendship and he came up to me and said, Tuck, I'm, I'm gay, are you okay with that? I said, of course I'm okay with that, of course I am. And that was the first moment that anyone had revealed to me about their sexuality. And so I took this courage and I became myself. I walked into the depths of who I am as an Asian and gay male, and I learned much more than that, that who I am is much, much more than that. This led me to fulfill one of my biggest dreams, which was to have a la fashion label with my mother that would present collections on the international stage. And in 2015, me and my mother as we held hands and came out of the runway, we became the first Thai fashion label to ever present collections during Paris Haute Couture Week. <coughs> now soon after this, in 2016, and right after the Paris attacks in 2015, I felt that, we, that I, my trajectory of life shifted slightly and that I want to explore career as an artist. And so I lived as an artist. I bought a piece of sculpture in 2016 by an artist called Leonardo Drew. And I went to his studio in New York City, in Cypress Hills, New York City, and he opened this, this what I felt was a temple and cathedral, his art studio, he opened this up to me and I was amazed, I was in awe. It was so beautiful. And then he drove me out of the studio and towards a cemetery. And I remembered as we stepped onto this cemetery that was covered in snow, 
he walked me to a graveyard he had discovered and it happened to be Piet Mondrian's grave who you may know is a master in composition. Soon after, I found myself at an art fair in New York City, a couple months later, where I met Miss Ursula von Reidingsvard. And Miss Ursula is this beautiful lady, this graceful lady in her 70s, who makes sculptures the size of the ceiling and even beyond this. And she asked me with her piercing eyes, she looked at me and she said, are you an artist? And through this question, which I received from her, I started inquiring myself deeper what it means to be an artist. This led me to a time when I met um, a very well-known gallerist who represents Ai Weiwei. And if you, in Ai Weiwei in 2015, Art, Art Review ranked as the world's number one artist. I met him without knowing who he was. I met him as, as myself and, and we had this kind connection. And I followed this up by visiting his gallery a couple months later, where I was invited to a gala dinner. And I brought my works with me. And I, I showed him my works. And he said these, these words that continue to move me. He said, I'm very honoured. I'm very honoured. And in my humility, I can only say thank you. Thank you to me, to having the courage to enough so that I could shine and be myself, to be Asian and gay and also dive into the depths of who I am as a creative human being. And with this with this profound knowing, I came across the definition of perhaps what the highest function of an artist by, by a man called Rupert Spira. And he said, the highest function of an artist is to make beauty, nature's eternity manifest. And I now try my best to do that. And it was these words I'm very honored that perhaps led to my incident last week. As I came back from another tele event, I left my overground station, I tapped out my oyster, and this man with beautiful eyes looked back at me with a smile. To my surprise, it was my bully from school, who I've not met in eight years. And he looked at me and he treated me with so much kindness and such excitement that I'm giving this talk today. And perhaps it is true that what I've learned in my life is that how you treat yourself is how you treat the world and how the world treats you. So as I treat myself now with respect and kindness and love, he, the same human being with the exact same component, uh, components as he used to have, treated me with these, with kindness, love, and respect. Beloved brothers and sisters, I would love to offer you a new perspective today. Perhaps instead of seeking to change the world and asking the question, how does the world treat I? Ask, how do you, you treat yourself? How do I treat myself? Know yourself. Love yourself. And treat yourself accordingly by being yourself. Indeed, when Michael Jackson sang the song Man in the Mirror, he said, If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make that change. Indeed, when Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world, be it. 
Know what it means to be you. Be it. Be the kindness you wish to see in the world. Be the love you wish to see in the world. Be the compassion you wish to see in the world. Be the harmony you wish to see in the world. Be the cooperation you wish to see in the world. And be the reverence that you wish to see for yourself and the world. And indeed, perhaps you will remember the love song of yourself. Which sings back at you, bright and clear, I love you. I love you. I love you so much. Thank you. <laughs>